everyone. I'm Dr. John Shrigley, the prevailing head of the Pathology Lab Medicine Program at CCO and the chair of the National Pathology Standards Committee for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, CPAC, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome everyone to today's educational session on the invasive breast cancer protocol, which is being given by Dr. Jean Simpson. Before we introduce our speaker and we get it underway formally, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be approximately 90 minutes in length and will include a 60-minute presentation to be followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. The session is being recorded and will be made available to all participants via email links once the recording becomes available. Both live presentation and the recorded presentation are eligible for CME credits upon completion and submission of an evaluation form available electronically. Information for accessing the evaluation form was provided in the notice of the session previously distributed. Please note that the CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The recorded sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but the CME certificates will be issued for one month. Please refer to the session notice for additional details. Please note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. Large number of participants, we are unable to troubleshoot any WebEx connectivity issues as part of this call. If you are having difficulties accessing the WebEx portion of the teleconference, please call the WebEx support line at 1-866-293239. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. For questions on how to use the WebEx chat window, please refer to the documentation previously distributed. Answer period. In order to avoid question collisions, I will pose the submitted questions on your behalf as long as time permits and in the order in which they are received. In the window, please indicate the following things your institutional name, the name of the person posing the question, and then finally your question. To now introduce Dr. Gene Simpson. Dr. Simpson is a professor of pathology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She's a graduate of the Medical, Medical College of Georgia and was a resident in anatomical pathology at Vanderbilt. During that time and subsequently during her fellowship time at Vanderbilt, she had an emphasis on breast cancer pathology under the direction of Dr. David Page. She's involved in epidemiological studies of pre-malignant lesions from the Nashville Breast Cohort and has been active in, in breast consultation practice and teaching. Dr. is a member of the College of American Pathology Cancer Committee and chair of of the Breast Protocol Review Committee. At a personal level, I've known Jean for a number of years, most recently as a member of the Cancer Committee, and she's one of a cadre of excellent breast pathologists who have been trained by Dr. David Page. And I'm sure everybody on the call realizes that we have some people in Canada as well, Francis O'Malley and Bev Carter, who are also protégés of David Page. Jean was also very active uh, several years ago in the K Association of Pathology uh, workshops on breast cancer, which she gave for a number of years. So without any further ado, Jean, I will hand the microphone over to you to give us our National WebEx Conference on the Invasive Breast Checklist. Thank you, Mr. Shrigley, and uh, thank you for that kind, kind uh, introduction. Um, I feel a very strong connection with uh, uh, my northern neighbors in Canada. Um, as you said, I was um, very fortunate to do some workshops with Francis O'Malley, the uh, Canadian Association of Pathology, and in addition to meeting some wonderful people in Canada, it uh, afforded me the opportunity to visit many parts of your wonderful country, and I uh, just, just loved it. Uh, so I'm sitting in my office smiling now, thinking about those uh opportunities and thinking about the people that I met and especially thinking about Frank and Beth Carter. Um, so thank you thank you so much for that. Um, anyone who's done one of these uh, WebEx uh, seminars will tell you that it's a little strange to sit in your office and talk to your computer. Um, I enjoy very much audience uh, interactions and so um, I, I do have those as we speak. On the other hand, like the fact that you can't tell if I'm having a bad hair day, um, so uh, this may be a whole new frontier for me. I especially want to thank Rachel Healy for connecting me to the WEX uh, 15 minutes ago. I just about had a come apart when I thought things weren't going to work, but I should have had little faith. Rachel got a 
was connected. So with uh, with no further ado, let's talk about some issues that have come to the CAP uh, breast cancer, uh, especially invasive. That's what we're going to focus on today, the invasive breast cancer checklist. We have uh, heard similar um, discussions about why do we even do a cancer checklist. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about that and, and going through some of the rationale. I just strictly coined the term diagnostic oncologist um, for we but I uh, we pathologist, but I really like um, I like that term because that is in fact uh, a large part of what we do is diagnostic oncology, and the information that comes from cancer checklists is uh, critically important for treating physicians, surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and other healthcare providers. Help determine the patient's prognosis, optimize the care of the patient, and even more than that, study uh, disease burden in society, to registrars, and, and uh, the like. So the information that we provide is is critically important. The uh, uh, cancer pulse or checklists are, have become an integral part of routine pathology practice, and um, I find them actually helpful because they do encourage consistency. Uh, they also facilitate comprehensive inclusion of important data. If I didn't have the checklist to work from, I'm sure I would forget some uh, important information. And you'd think, breast pathologist, that I should have that uh, completely committed to memory, but I don't. And I frequently will forget something. And so having the checklist there in front of me is help- helpful to to include all the things that we that we need. See that the ch- also do reduce ambiguity. Um, so adding a format that it's easy to extract data from makes it easier to communicate that important information. So I think the, the checklist or protocols are, are useful for many uh The cancer protocols are put together by a multidisciplinary team, and it's by the uh, College of American Pathology Cancer Committee. It does facilitate comprehensive cancer reporting, and in America, in the U.S., that is, um, see accredited laboratories uh, are required to use these checklists. And for hospitals that are um, uh, have an American College of Surgeon um, um, designation, uh, it is required that at least 90% of reports include the checklists. And more recently, the Canadian Association of Pathology have uh, unanimously uh, come on board using these checklists. So this is all information that you already know, but I think it's worthwhile reviewing. And the checklists, of course, have required elements and optional elements. Uh, and I am personally a, 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 a I try to do things in a streamlined fashion. I certainly don't want to overlook anything that's important. But I like the fact that we can separate things into required elements versus optional elements. Of course, after the checklist, there are um, pages and pages of explanatory notes, which are, for the most part, I think, very helpful. The explanatory notes are are intended to do just that. Uh, sometimes the notes will say, you, sh- you should do such and such, actually an optional element. Um, but I think that is not um, mutually exclusive. I think it's the practice but our elements have not been proven in rigorous um, uh, levels of, of evidence. That's why they are, in fact, optional. Currently, 65 protocols for uh, different malignancies, and most are designed for resection specimens, and certainly for, for breast cancer, that, that's what we'll be talking about. The rest of the checklist, and you, I'm sure you're aware of this, but um, it was apparent not so many years ago that important elements were inconsistently reported. And those of you who have been practicing for a while, I, I expect you can remember that's the case. When we started using checklist at Vanderbilt a number of years ago, we did a, a bit of audit, and it was somewhat appalling how often some some information was left out. It were created. And then in 2005, the CP Cancer Committee created uh, cancer protocol review panels uh, which are multidisciplinary and have been designed to try to include uh, 
evidence-based um, uh, data. Uh, cancer protocols are re revised frequently to incorporate all scientifically val validated data elements for each cancer type, and the revised protocols incorporate the new staging parameters of the seventh edition of the ACC uh, stage manual, as well as the recent WHO tumor classification system that um, uh, the early work has begun uh, on the eighth edition, so we can only imagine what that will be like. So as I show here, the original staging manual on the right, uh, published in 1967, and the current staging manual that we use now, the 7th edition. Uh, these books are lined up, and you can see that the 7th edition is a little bit taller. And uh, if Bev Carter happens to be on the line, she will recognize that uh, characteristic DP in the top right corner of the 1977 manual. That's uh, uh, the original staging manual given to me by David Page. What's interesting, though, is if you look at these manuals side by side, um, and this is not trick photography, <laughs> there's of course a whole lot more information that is now uh, included in the seventh edition compared to the original material. That the difference in thickness is all because of breast pathology. In fact, it's not. It's uh, many many different uh, uh, tumor types are included in the seventh edition that that were not originally, and lots more information as well as uh, validation. So if we look at the uh, College of American Pathology checklist on the left, the the last uh, edition in 2009. And then the current one on the right, 2012. Hey, uh, I don't. I'll tell you that I don't work well from computers, and so I like to, uh, even though it's not very green, I like to print things and hold them. And so I, I actually will have a, a copy, a hard copy of uh, these various protocols, so that I can what I need quickly. You can tell by the size of the paper clip that. The 2009 version is actually larger than the 2012 version. And this is uh, not particularly trick photography. The one on the left, 2009 protocol or checklist, is a, a bit thicker than the 2012. So what I want to do now is talk about changes that have come in the new checklist. Well, the first change is we don't call it checklist anymore. We now call it a case summary or protocol. I don't know what the um, rationale was behind that, uh, but I think summary uh, is probably a more inclusive term and, and sounds a little better than a, a checklist, which sounds a little bit like you're going to the grocery store. Um, I, I, before before I continue, it's that um, I am now the lead of the uh, the panel for for breast cancer. I came onto the cancer committee. Uh, last year, just as this was, um, this new checklist was, was about to be launched, and I had the good fortune of being able to uh, do a bit of editing. Uh, I, I was not so much involved in the actual um, uh, writing of the document as more um, uh, editing. So, um, so now we're them case summaries or protocols, and we've also changed the symbol for all. So we used to use an asterisk in 2009, and now we use a little plus. Um, that's probably of no great consequence, except I think it is a little easier as you're flipping through to, to recognize the, the plus sign as, as an optional feature. So um, I'm quite proud of the new checklist. Yet I think this is simpler than the 2009 checklist, and I think that's – or sorry – I'll probably use those things interchangeably. Um, that is, um, it's a bit unusual, actually, to have a later uh, version be more simple. But I, I think that there are some things that have been simplified. And, and one of the things that's been simplified is we've done away with, with talking about what kind of specimen we have, we with specimen integrity, and we with specimen size. And I, I'm uh, these changes. Now, for specimen identification, we have the procedure. We have lymph node sampling, if it was 
formed. We'll come back to that in a bit. Lack of quality and tumor site. And the tumor site is actually optional. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me to talk about what kind of specimen you had and also describe a procedure. So a, before in 2009, a specimen type might have been a partial breast. But if you think about it, the procedure actually defines what kind of specimen you have. Uh, so we no longer have to say partial breast. We just get the procedure. As far as the specimen integrity goes, I believe that the 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 idea behind that was often we get specimens that are fragmented or have additional margins, and I believe that that was an attempt to try to address that. But it didn't, I think, go well. I think people didn't quite know how to interpret that. And frankly, does anybody really care about the specimen size? Is that uh, it, does that actually give uh, meaningful uh, prognostic information? It's in you know, a specimen somewhere, but it really doesn't need to be part of the summary. So if we look at some examples, now we have uh, maybe there's the laterality and guided excision. So that's the procedure. So I think that goes without saying that you have um, a, a less than a full mastectomy when we wire guided excision. Another example would be uh, left upper outer quadrant. The upper outer quadrant is optional. Uh, it's nice if you have it, but it's not required. A lump to me, um, you know what kind of specimen you have there, and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Example would be right axillary lymph nodes and modified radical mastectomy. So there again, you have the, the total breast and axillary lymph nodes. The uh, point about I'm going to go backwards here just a little bit. Um, uh, the point about the lymph node sampling is, if performed, if you don't receive lymph nodes with a specimen then you don't have to mention the fact that you didn't get lymph nodes. And I think that that is, uh, is helpful. Usually we get lymph nodes when there's been a, an invasive breast cancer. But it's where you, you don't get them. They don't have to mention that. And in the past, there's a long laundry list of the various types of sampling you had to check off. Uh, you don't have to do that now unless you actually get the lymph nodes. Uh, some of the elements that have been from required to optional include that lymph node sampling. And this is um, uh, these are the the options that we have: sentinel node or axillary dissection, or lymph nodes present within the specimen, such as intra um, mammary or other. But again, if you don't have lymph nodes with the specimen, then you don't have to. I did not get lymph nodes. It's understood. If you got them, you would be telling us where you got them from. I think this has been a little bit of a, um, a point of confusion. I think some people have assumed that required only if lymph nodes are present um, or submitted. I've understood a couple of people to think that reporting lymph nodes is optional. If you have lymph nodes, you have to report them. Another change, again, I think, this is just simplifying, is tumor fatality. The assumption is, if you have a single focus of invasive cancer, that you have to report. Uh, you don't have to say, I don't have multiple foci. So this is what the tumor fatality uh, list looks like. So focus of invasive carcinoma, multiple foci, and interestingly, if you have multiple foci, you don't have to give the number or the sizes. It's optional. I think it's a, a, a good practice, but it's not required. So those are the, the opportunities or the, the options there for tumor focality. Understanding is single focus, then you don't have to um, report any of uh, any of this information. The assumption is if it's more than one focus, then you will uh, only do that. So only required if there's more than one focus of invasive cancer. And the largest focus, if you happen to have multiple foci, the largest focus is what should be used for uh, reporting the size, the grade, the type, and ancillary studies. And from the 2009 checklist or case summary, 
uh, the difference here is it's assumed if there's only a single focus, um, it, it is assumed that there were no additional foci. If there are, then you can address that in several different ways. One is a comment or additional pathologic findings. We use an M as a qualifier if there are multiple foci and at the bottom there. I had a case recently that was on core biopsy uh, for carcinoma in situ. And then when incision was done, there's a good bit of DCIS, and uh, there were five different uh, areas of incision. None of it was larger than five millimeters. The largest was right at five millimeters. But interestingly, they all had different histologic patterns. I performed the clary um, studies on uh, the largest focus, but then the metallurgist with whom I work asked me to uh, also perform analyses on the different histologic patterns. So that's really um, a pathologist uh, discretion after discussion with the treating physician. But what's required is to, to do these things and report the largest single focus. Uh, we think are, are, were one is this business about macroscopic and microscopic extent of tumor. I think that that's been confusing um, to, to many of us. That has been um, uh, modified uh, significantly. The macroscopic and or microscopic extent of tumor is designed to report if there is invasion of the skin, the nipple, or skeletal muscle. If the structures are but not involved by cancer, then, then we don't have to give any information about extent of tumor. This really only applies if the structures are present and involved, and that really simplifies uh, the reporting. Let's just go um, here to um, talk about this. This often is a bit of confusion uh, when invasive cancer involves the dermis. I've, I've seen folks want to increase the stage on that, but in fact, if you have skin ulceration, uh, it's in fact, uh, effect on the T stage. So invasive cancer invading into the dermis or the epidermis with that dermal ulceration is still uh, um, based on the size of the tumor. The invasive carcinoma invades the dermis or the epidermis with skin ulceration, then that is a, a higher T stage or satellite skin foci, not contiguous with the main mass. I um, am, am actually proud of it. It's a simple, simple thing, but um, the nipple involvement. If we have DCIS involving the nipple epidermis, that is, of course, Paget's disease. Uh, the, uh, in previous checklists, we had a statement about invasive cancer involving the dermis of the nipple. Well, the dermis of the nipple is not any different from a staging point of view from the dermis of the skin of the nipple. So it's important to report Paget's disease because there's a clinical correlate. We have, in fact, um, a, a clinical picture of Paget's disease, so it's important to present to to report that. But uh, if you have these involving the nipple, then, then uh, nipple involvement is in the, of the skin or the, the dermis is, is no different from any other um, associated with the with the lesion. And then still muscle. Um, it's uncommon now for us to actually get skeletal muscle, but if we do, um, and it's in fact, by the carcinoma, then we should report that. But if it's not, you don't have to uh, mention that you have skeletal muscle, but it's not involved. Again, it just simplifies the reporting. I need to remember that the pectoralis muscle is not chest wall. I had a uh, question recently about... Um, uh, if invasive cancer was into the pectoralis muscle, the surgeon had taken a, a generous uh, deep margin and had pectoralis, mu pectoralis muscle. That is not chest wall. Um, it has to 
be deep pectoralis muscle to qualify as a T4A. Much to be said about uh, this change. Again, I think it's a welcome relief. No longer are required to report LIS, lobular carcinoma in situ. I think it is a mistake to equate carcinoma in situ of the large type with, with the ductal type. I mean, DIS has important uh, ramifications as far as uh, disease occurrence and margin status and things like that, whereas LCIS does not. So there's no um, good evidence uh, that supports the routine reporting of LCIS, so no longer do we have to. If you uh, want to do that, it's certainly optional, but it's not required. And another, I think, very welcome relief is distant metastasis no longer has to be addressed. Uh, as you know, of course, that the patient has a distant metastasis, which is on a pathologic diagnosis. So one, again, I think very helpful indication um, of these checklists is the clinician has been excluded from these checklists. If you read the 2009 checklist, you'll see that there's a, a place to to the try to incorporate clinical staging with pathologic staging, which was nothing but confusing. Um, it talked out whether there were uh, tumor cells in somebody's bone marrow clinically, and and I mean that's just not what what we're supposed to be doing as pathologists. So now we only document distant metastasis if we are aware of it from a pathologic point of view. And staging, uh, the TNM definitions have been modified to exclude the, the clinical information. So I think that's a uh, sort of clarifies the situation and makes it easier. And the MX has been eliminated from the AJCC study manual. So uh, I still occasionally will see our references as they're filling out these case summaries put in MX and, and uh, certainly don't need to be using that. Margins. Uh, reporting of margins has been changed in the new um, commentary. And I think that, um, again, I made it a, a, a bit simpler, or it seems to me that it's made it more um, practical. So we have a, a place where we can check if the margins cannot be assessed. That could be a number of reasons. Um, maybe the investment uh, was not oriented at all, and the and it's not clear if the specimen came in various fragments. It's not clear what's a real margin and what's not. Hopefully that doesn't happen very often, but if it does, uh, we check the margins cannot be assessed, but that would be addressed in a comment. So there are, for invasive carcinoma, the margins are unsolved by carcinoma, and in that situation, we need to give the closest margin, the distance to the closest margin in millimeters. Interestingly, it's optional. You specify which margin that is. Now, I certainly try to do that. I try to give the closest margin is three millimeters, and, and it's lateral. You might wonder why it was optional. I believe the reason that was made optional is occasionally we want a specimen that's not oriented. The surgeon has not um, uh, given landmarks, so we, in fact, can't tell which margin is which. That should not happen, but it, but it does. And so I think that's the reason this was made optional. If the required element, and yet you are handed a specimen in which you can't address that, then it leaves you a bit in limbo. So if the margin is uninvolved, then we give the closed margin, and I think it's a good practice to specify which margin, although it's not absolutely required. If the margin is positive for invasive carcinoma, we need to check that box, then it's a good idea to tell which margin is involved, although not required for the same reason I just described in case the specimen was not oriented. So need to uh, ask whether DCIS is present at the margin. Uh, we know that in breast conservation, the presence of DCIS is a strong predictor of residual disease within the breast, and so for uh, that reason, we need to address whether or not DCIS is present at the margin. So, DCIS not present, we can check that, or margins involved, 
and we would need to get the closest uh, distance. It pretty much parallels the invasive carcinoma reporting. And margin is positive. We need to check that box. And it's helpful to say if we know which margin is, in fact, positive for CIS. Now, here's a change uh, in the 2012 checklist from, from uh, the 2009. In the past, and, and I didn't make a slide of this because I, I'm, I'm glad I've gone away, but you will probably remember that there was a long list. It was all optional. But the long list that you could actually give the distance for every margin uh, is uh, no part of the case summary. Instead, if and this is optional, if there's a positive margin, then there is an opportunity to try to um, address the extent of involvement. So again, optional, but have so this is your margin focally involved. You could have the lateral margin uh, moderately involved. And moderate actually, um, equates to more than four millimeters of involvement. Extensive involvement is a broad uh, front of uh, carcinoma at the margin, more than five millimeters. So if you want to try to address some, some radiation oncologists want to know how much margin involvement there is, uh, a little bit of margin involvement, they they may not uh, problem with radiation in that setting, may not require re-excision. Again, optional, but I think it, it makes more sense than just giving uh, distances to negative margins. It makes more sense to actually report how much margin involvement there is. The area that has changed, um, and I don't think that this is a, a, of any quality, Consequence, but in the 2009 checklist, the mitotic um, activity was given as a, as a count. Um, and in, you're aware that there are tables that uh, adjust the field diameter and formulas to try to standardize uh, the size of the field so that we're all reporting um, similar amounts of mitotic activity. If my field diameter is, is huge uh, and have uh, um, mitosis in that field, that's quite a bit different from a very small diameter the field that has six mitoses. So in the past, in 2009, what was a count, uh, which was uh, from this table, uh, you could follow on what your field diameter was, and then depending on how many mitotic figures you had, uh, it would qualify score one, score two, or score three. The difference now is that that has been um, all reflect a uh, number of mitoses per square millimeter, and then it becomes fairly standardized um, regardless of what size field diameter you're dealing with. If you have fewer than three mitoses in a square millimeter, then that's going to equate to a score one and so forth. So it's just a, an attempt at um, standing and making that a bit consistent. It's the same. Uh, look at the number of mitoses under score one, score two, and score three in the table. It's uh, it's the same information. Interestingly, uh, the number of mitoses per 10 high power fields uh, can be given, but it's not required. Another um, feature of the new case summary, which I think is um, uh, more than, than it has been, is uh, whether there's a ductal carcinoma in situ component. So we do, we are required to say if DCIS is present or not, but we don't have to report if there's an extensive introductal component. Optional. Uh, I personally uh, report that but um, it's, it's certainly required. And the reason that it is now an optional feature is um, we address conservation if there's uh, extensive uh, um, DS that uh, the likelihood of local recurrence is greater. Um, but there are other features. For instance, if the margins are, are widely free, 
the presence of an extensive introductory component is of less consequence. If only focal involvement with an extensive introductory component um, is of less consequence. So uh, from a um, uh, rigorous uh, uh, analysis, um, it, the presence of an extensive introductory component probably is not that that critical. Uh, so for that reason, it's an optional feature now. Well, let's talk about lymph node reporting because this, again, is an area that I think has caused some um, angst and a little bit of confusion. Um, so this reporting is very similar to what was present in 2009. Uh, total number of sentinel lymph nodes examined. Uh, total lymph nodes all the sentinel lymph nodes plus non-sentinel lymph nodes examined. So those uh, points are no different from 2009. You need to also that have more than um, six sentinel, more than six lymph nodes. We really should not be calling those sentinel, even if the surgeon does, because a low axillary dissection um, is defined is more than six lymph nodes. So then look at the various categories, um, place for the number of lymph nodes that have macrometastasis, have a place for the number of lymph nodes that have micrometastasis, and as, as written on the screen there. And then we have a place for the number that have isolated tumor cells. It's no different from 2009. What is new is the final uh, listing there that's the number of lymph nodes without tumor cells identified. So um, this also has caused a little bit of confusion um, with think folks thinking that, that this is an optional feature. Um, I just look at it from a practical point of view. Let's three sentinel lymph nodes and total nodes were five, so that to me would mean we had three sentinel nodes and two non-sentinel. And let's say there were no metastases at all in these nodes, then the bottom line there is number of lymph nodes without tumor cells is five. I believe that it is not uh, necessary to put zeros in all the other blanks. I think if you do the math, it's pretty clear we have five total nodes and five without, without metastases. So uh, I think it goes without saying that the other uh, lines have to be zeros. So I think it's not critical to put n slash a or zero. I think we can just leave those areas blank. So a, a couple of examples here. Um, here's a node. Uh, looks very, very reniform. For a urinal pathologist, it looks like a big kidney. And this tumor is... Um, uh, replaced by um, emesis. So if we are example of a total of five nodes, we would have one here that's a macro metastasis. I think this form, although it looks a little cumbersome, I think it's very useful for a reminder of um, which category these metastases belong in. So from this point of view, you can e quickly see we have five total nodes, one with a macromet, and four that are benign. So one of five involved, uh, four benign lymph nodes. For example, and maybe at the bottom you can see that there's a little metastasis. This is less than two millimeters, 1.7 millimeters. So if you use our example of five lymph nodes total, then we would have one under the uh, category of micromet. We would still have four nodes that are negative. Again, I don't think it's necessary to put zeros in all the other places. If you add one four, you're going to get five. Here's an example um, that I saw just recently. Um, this woman had a, a very low-grade invasive carcinoma in the breast and in sentinel lymph node, she had this little area, and there are about 50 cells here in the circle. So this, using the same example, this would be a single lymph node with isolated tumor cells. 
four nodes with no tumor cells. Put this in for fun. Um, here's a, a lymph node that I saw recently, and um, this, of course, is not a metastasis, a metastasis at all. Uh, these are uh, giant cells and hemosiderin associated with the previous uh, procedure. And um, I just throw it in because Bev Carter wrote a nice paper a number of years ago about um, uh, and sentinel lymph nodes after procedures. Some mirrors. Uh, the ACC 7th edition serves as a good reminder that um, zero with I plus is isolated to tumor cells no larger than um, tenths of a millimeter. P1MI is a micrometastasis, big than 0.2 millimeter, or more than 200 cells, but bigger than 2 millimeters. PN1A is a metastasis in 1 to 3 nodes. At least one met has to be bigger than 2 millimeters. So the point of all this is, although Uh, may be a bit confusing and, and excessive, it does help you lay out where the metastases are and what the sizes are, and I think it helps you arrive at the final uh, end stage um, aging much, much easier. So if we um, only have isolated tumor cells, of course that's not going to uh, uh, as um, an N1 um, uh, stage. So the other um, important thing, and I've already alluded to this, but the other important change in the new Camry is that the staging, the TNM staging, uh, all of the definitions related to clinical information have now been removed. So this is truly pathologic staging. The entry studies have been um, modified a bit in the um, summary. If you 2009 version, there are tons of information about um, not on the specimen or pending, or uh, it, 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 if we felt the need to tell people anything that we were doing when, in fact, it didn't really make any difference. So now, now studies are required only if they are available at the time that you complete the report. I think this also simplifies our life a lot like to assume that um, people common sense and do the right thing, and obviously if you had the information, you would report it then, uh, but, but if you don't have it, for whatever reason, um, then it's not required to address that. So we have estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 changes now in 2012, uh, just we're called PGR instead of PR. Not a change, but um, one that was actually instituted. So now when we report ancillary studies, uh, receptor, we now not only report the results given an interpretation, and that's something that's different from the 2009 version. So we get percentage. If, if it's positive, we give a percentage of cells with nuclear positivity, and we give an average intensity. So these are required elements now. And these are the uh, the definitions that are held out now. If it's less than percent of cells that are that are positive, then that is negative. The other uh, option for negative. The other way you could have a negative result is have absolutely no nuclear positivity. Uh, and this is important and it reflects the ASCO uh, guidelines and, and what we're now considering to be a positive result. So if we have 1% or more, that is in fact a positive result. That also parallels 
the proficiency testing that the College of American Pathology does with immunohistochemistry for estrogen and progesterone receptors. Um, uh, over 100 labs participate in that. And uh, interestingly, although the instructions are pretty clear that if it's one or more, it should be considered a positive result, we still have folks who require up to 10% before they'll call something positive. Um, and not surprising, uh, those are the cases in which we, we lack consensus um, in entering. So uh, negative is less than 1% or absolutely no expression at all. So the, the, opportunity, the options for reporting ancillary studies now. The, uh, the same uh, um, report is done for the progesterone receptor. You know, in the past, in the 2009 version, there was no interpretation. It was just um, uh, the, whether there were cells that were expressing it or not. But now we are actually forced to call something positive or, or negative, and I think that's a, uh, uh, that will go a long way to standardizing how we're doing these things. Uh, there really are no uh, uh, substitute changes just to the to the her two uh, and it's the same um information that was provided in two thousand nine. The difference is uh if the result's not available then you don't have to uh address that. So it pretty much allows how we're doing the estrogen and progesterone reporting at this point. So um that is uh, a, a little um fact that I had anticipated through but um, the, the major changes in the protocol, and I think that they are, for the most part, changes have made reporting simpler. Um, I hope that that will be the case. Uh, about the time that the eighth edition of the AJCC uh, around will be time to um, open this checklist or this case summary, and I will be um, um, very involved in that. So. I solicit feedback, and, and we'll be happy to try, try to answer any questions that, that come along. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean. That was great. Um, we have a number of questions that have popped up already, actually, and I'm sure some more will be coming in uh, as we're going along here. But, but the first question is from uh, Pratiba Iyengar at Trillium Health Partners. How to address pleomorphic LCIS in case summary? Do you report it as DCIS for treatment purposes? That's a great question, and that um, that pretty much reflects uh, my practice, and I think that's also part of the the um, the thought process about making LCIS required. Um, the LCIS that is not required is the uh, the LCIS that uh, is a risk indicator lesion. If it's pleomorphic um, and is associated with the mass and uh, has what we think is the biologic uh, potential of DIS with necrosis and that sort of thing, and I think for reporting purposes, um, for the, the chat, I would include that under the DCIS category. And another question from uh, Cam Loops, which is out in lovely British Columbia. Can you indicate uh, if the margin is greater than 10 millimeters, or do we need to be more specific? I think that's a great question, and uh, I'm, I might get myself in trouble with the uh, with the CAP. But I frequently, if I have a, a very wide margin like that, I'll just say widely negative, uh, greater greater than um, 10 millimeters. Uh, you know, if you if you think about it from the surgeon's point of view, when they see that a margin is is a centimeter. They're happy with that. I mean, they're happy with five millimeters. I don't think they're going to care if it's 11 versus 10. So I think it is um, perfectly acceptable to say more uh, than a centimeter. And on that subject, uh, uh, one thing I do, and I, I know that people's um, prices are um, individualized, but if I have initial excision that has a margin that's maybe three millimeters, and then I have a re-excision at the same time, a new margin that supersedes that, then I support uh, the final margin. Uh, I think surgeons, again, need to, these reports are used by used people, but the surgeon needs to have a report that is simple and easy to, uh, 
to get information from. And so I, I will put those together and just give the, the fine margin. Okay, questions come in from Dr. Corey Wiegensberg at Scarborough General Hospital in Toronto. Uh, if positive margin requires ink on tumor, do you, re do you uh, report a margin as positive and then give the distance in microns? <laughs> uh no <laughs> I, I don't uh i uh if if the tumor is at the margin i just call it positive um and, you know just from my own practice if it, if there's tumor that's um maybe half a millimeter i, I often will i call that positive i think a half a millimeter from a biological point of view is is a positive margin um, so there's, I think there's a little wiggle room in that, and and some room for for common sense. So, so I, I would not try to uh, cite a, uh, a mill much much more than that. And I think if there's only one or two braved brave rubber blasts holding the tumor back, then that's in fact a positive margin. So another question from Trillium Health Partners: uh, Do you report LVI at the margin as positive margin? That's a great question. Um, you know, I is uh, um, I think it's those areas that is um, it, it can be often very difficult. Um, I do report that, but I make it very clear that it is in a vascular space because I think that that is different, and I think a surgeon won't go back uh, for the eye um, at a margin necessarily uh, because the understanding is. That is probably uh, uh, tumor, or or they may, but I think it's important for them to realize this is in a space and not a contiguous um, growth pattern. So I do report it, but I make it very clear that it's in a vascular space. From Cam Loops from uh, Raymond Monk, do you recommend synoptic reporting for core breast biopsies? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't recommend synoptic reporting for biopsies. I, I think it's it's certainly acceptable if, if people want to do that. But um, I think the the important thing for a corpse is just to get the information to the radiologist or the surgeon and make sure that we're trying to correlate what we see um, with um, what they've seen on imaging. Um, the rule rule. No role for uh, any of these uh, case summaries for core biopsies or uh, for incisional biopsies, that sort of thing. So the checklist, and I, I know that's not what your question is, but the checklist is only for excisional uh, or, or l larger specimens. Okay. Uh, the question is, do you use IHC of, of metastasis in lobular carcinoma? Uh, and assume the question is in a lymph node. Is that the is that the question? Okay. Um, well, uh, no, I, I don't. Um, and you know the uh, the recommendations now uh, for examining sentinel lymph nodes actually um, is to uh, thoroughly section it um, thinly and completely embed the lymph node. But there there um, it's no uh, good evidence. That doing multiple levels or immunohistochemistry will um, uh, make a significant difference, and so I actually do not do uh, immunohistochemistry uh, for lymph nodes. I know a lot of people do, uh, but it's it's not uh, recommended, and um, the study should be done on what you see on H&E. Don Weaver, who's done a tremendous amount of work, um, he's at the University of Vermont, uh, much closer to Canada than I am, uh, has a uh, Done a lot of work on sentinel lymph nodes, and um, he he's not in favor of um, ancillary studies to try to try to find uh, isolated tumor cells in that setting. Another good question: How do you do T classification for insisted papillary carcinoma with stromal invasion? This is a great question. Um, so, um, an insisted papillary carcinoma uh, would be non-invasive, and so if let's say we have a three centimeter, and sometimes that's not unheard of, a three centimeter uh, assisted carcinoma growing in the the uh, great expanded duct, 
and there's a three millimeter focus of stromal invasion. The T staging should be based on the area of stromal invasion. Certainly, you would want to describe in your report that you have this this large mass because um, that's what the in fact the the surgeon has has gone after. But um, it's analogous to having a tremendous amount of DCIS in a breast and only a single focus of uh, invasion that's two or three millimeters. So T staging should be based on the invasive component. Another from uh, North York General Hospital, Dr. C.S. Leung. This is in Toronto. Uh, our microscopic foci of tumor in the dermis associated with LVI considered satellite tumor modules. First question, is there a size criterion? No, I, I believe that uh, in, a, in a space that is not, uh, that's not what is intended by um, uh, the um, involvement of structures. I think it needs to be a, a stromal invasive uh, component to qualify. Um, and I don't know that there's a size. There is not a size criterion, but it needs to be stromal, stromal invasion. And that brings up an interesting point. Um, this was not a question, but I'll just go ahead and talk, talk about it for a second, if I may. Um, inflammatory breast cancer is a clinical diagnosis, and so um, we we often will see dermal lymphatic invasion in a breast that clinically is inflammatory breast cancer, and it's uh, when you you can uh, correlate those, but if we have normal lymphatic involvement and there's not a clinical picture of inflammatory breast cancer, then um, then it's not inflammatory breast cancer. And, and inflammatory breast cancer is uh, under the clinical staging. So we don't uh, we do a a, uh, a teach for inflammatory breast cancer. That is a a clinical um, entity and a clinical stage. Another question from Kathy Stryker at St. Michael's Hospital of Toronto. Do you have any suggestions for reporting lymph nodes containing metastatic globular carcinoma with a diffuse pattern of spread in which the burden metastasis is large but no focus is greater than 200 cells or greater than 0 0.2 millimeters in size? Well, that's such a boogaboo, and I appreciate that question, and I'm sorry that it was asked because I think it's really hard. Um, but I, and, and throughout the uh, the 2012 case uh, uh, summary and the explanatory notes, it says over and over again um, that there are opportunities where the pathologist just has to use his or his, her best judgment. Uh, I think that in that situation that was described, uh, that I think that probably should be considered a macro metastasis. Um, if the note is peppered throughout, even though the individual little foci are or on the side, if it's peppered throughout, I think the intent is is to behave as a macro metastasis, and I think that's uh, that's how it should be reported. Things is uh, uh, open to debate, and um, there are some nice examples that Susan Lester did in the 2012 uh, case summary explanatory notes that tries to get at some of those um, uh, things, but um, it, it's just like trying to measure. The T stage in the breast in lobular. Um, sometimes you will see uh, a breast full of tumor, but it's small, small areas. Um, maybe each of them is five or six millimeters, but it's throughout the breast. And in that situation, I think you just have to consider that the tumor burden is, is pretty great and it's a higher T stage. There's, I don't know who sent this one in, but it, it says follows. What are recommendations? For use of KI67. Um, it's a, that's a, a good question. Um, trying to assess proliferative activity using um, uh, usually it's the MIB1 antibody that looks at the KI67 antigen proliferation antigen. There was a time when we did that routinely at Vanderbilt um, on all breast cases, and it correlates generally pretty well with the mitotic activity, although not not perfectly. Um, part of the problem is that it's hard to to validate at yeah. what the cut points are. So you can you could report you know, that the um, uh, proliferative activity is let's say 15 percent. Uh, do our patients know that 15 percent is uh, is a high proliferative rate? Um, there have not been enough studies that have actually patients who are treated the same way to to get good information from that point. So we now, in fact, don't do that. Um, I 
uh, law anyone who does it because I think it it can be useful information, um, but it's certainly not required. And like it, uh, then I think that's that's great. But but it's it's not required, and, and we don't do it any any longer. Okay, here's a question from uh, Dr. Mohammed Sharaf Eldian. With positive node, do you uh, how do you comment on LVI if you do not see involvement? I'm not sure I understand the question, John. I'm sorry. I think the, I think the question: If you have a positive node, you don't see LVI. Oh. How do you report that? Well, it's just a positive node. Uh, I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, I think we often see uh, metastatic disease in lymph nodes without finding um, uh, lymphocular invasion. So I, I, that doesn't that wouldn't sway me. I would, would ignore the, uh, the question of LVI in that situation. Uh, and as a reminder, the the prostatic information that is um, obtained from, from uh, looking for LVIs is really useful only in the periphery of the tumor. So if you have Vascular invasion in the center of the mass that is uh, does not have um, prognostic significance. Th this is not really in the in the chemistry, but I only report LVI if it's peritumoral, um, and in that setting it 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 does portend a, a worse prognosis. But I don't require finding it in the tumor, um, uh, and if I don't see it and and I see a metastasis, I don't that make me wring my hands. Okay, here's from uh, Dr. McKinney uh, in, in Edmonton, uh, an informatics question. What pathology information system does your institution use, and is your system considered a true synoptic database rather than just a word or synoptic-like document? That's, a, that's a, uh, not a great question for me right now. <laughs> we, uh, we have, um, ha Vanderbilt has a system that was bought by GE, uh, it is uh, uh, being used out, and we are about to undertake sometime this year. It's my understanding that we're going to get a new uh, laboratory information system, and I believe that it's Cerner, but I, I'm wrong about that. Um, so I, I probably can't really address that. Um, it's cut. I really can't remember. Um, I'm in a position of making those decisions are having to deal with the headaches, fortunately, these days. So um, uh, so I really can't answer that. I think whichever one we're supposed to be getting uh, is just to um, be able to, to interact and download this information easily into some sort of synoptic uh, um, report. Question from uh, Khalida Nassim. Uh, do we have to report the ancillary results from a previous specimen for the current specimen? That's a good question, and I, and I appreciate the person bringing that up. Um, it's actually not required to report uh, the previous. Um, I think it's a, a nice uh, a nice practice, uh, but it's not required. So what I do is we routinely do the ancillary studies on the initial core biopsy, and we repeat them uh, in excision unless... Uh, the um, morphology is different, or there's a, a, a different pattern, or uh, if the original core biopsy was negative, I think it's certainly at that point you would want to repeat it. Um, but uh, sometimes I will say that um, this were performed on a previous um, specimen and, and are not repeated. Um, it, it's not required to um, to include that in the definitive procedure. Okay, here's from Ottawa Hospital from Dr. Islam. How do you deal with flat epithelial atypia on biopsy and resection specimens? Uh, well, uh, you know, the whole importance of, and, and we actually uh, prefer the columnar cell lesion with atypia because it's a little more precise, I think. But the whole point of those on a core biopsy is um, it, it, should be excised because of the um, of having a more concerning lesion as part of that that change. So, you know, if you have um, that change core biopsy, you might well have atypical ductal hyperplasia or low-grade DCIS or 
or something like that in the in the vicinity. So from that point of view, a biopsy that has a columnar cell lesion with atypia um, gets excision. If you have a columnar cell lesion with atypia in the excision, I don't report it. It's it's really a consequence in that setting. It's really only a sampling issue on the core that that buys that woman an excision. We need to remember that a columnar cell lesion with atypia is actually not associated with a, a great increased risk of later cancer development. Um, National Breast Cohort published a couple of years ago, uh, uh, columnar lesions with atypia had the same relative risk as usual hyperplasia. So I think they've gotten a, sort of a bad rap. Um, folks think of them as a high-risk lesion, but they're in fact not. Um, the risk is that on a core biopsy, there may be something lying right in the same area. So that's why we recommend excision. And that's a very timely question. I had a, a core biopsy that I interpreted recently, and I did columnar cell lesion with atypia, uh, which I think would equate to, to A. And the, the patient, who is actually a physician, uh, called and wanted to discuss the case with me, and we, we discussed it at length. And I think I helped her understand the the importance when I said, if this were in an excision, we would have in this conversation because it is of no consequence when it's in the excision. The only really reason to report it is that it's associated with um, calcification and and um, uh, would correlate with the imaging findings. It's a detailed question. Uh, if multiple foci of microinvasion are around DCIS, do you sum them all up? And report as invasive carcinoma, or report as multiple foci of microinvasion, considering all all being on the same section in one slide. A ladder. So, um, if if there are multiple foci of microinvasion, then that is in fact what there is, and of course that should be less than a millimeter, so um, or a meter or less, I should say. Uh, so, I would, not, I would not add those together. I would just say. Um, uh, Multiple foci of microinvasion associated with DCIS solid type, and then in a in a comment, I would uh, reiterate that um, the largest cell focus was you know less than a meter, and um, uh, for staging purposes, that that's a microinvasive cancer. Okay, well, how do you how do you report a, a post neo specimen in the synoptic brackets case summary? Um, that um, for the question. There is, in fact, um, th this not a, a real change from 2009, so I, I didn't um, I didn't into that. But um, you know, there are attempts at at trying to um, get a handle on what the treatment response is after neoadjuvant therapy. Um, but there's no real good uh, or widely accepted. Um, System, no standard system for reporting trend effect. So, uh, of course, we need to use the Y modifier in staging that, that uh, is associated with uh, neoadjuvant uh, or pre-surgical treatment. Uh, and then I think what we need to do is, is do our best, um, give it our best effort of estimating the, the largest single focus um, with uh, acknowledgement that this is post-treatment and um, the be um, um, not completely straightforward. I mean, sometimes you can find a small area in one spot and then a lot of dense fibrosis uh, associated with these sites, um, which you would assume would be a lot of treatment effect, and then another focus of invasive carcinoma. I think it's to add those together, but I think that the report needs to make it clear what the single largest focus is, that it's associated with uh, dense fibrosis and, and areas of treatment effect. And, and with the Y modifier, I think that, that makes it pretty clear that um, that's the, uh, the best estimate of the size. Do you, do you use a synoptic report slash case summary for angiosarcoma? Oh, good question. Um, well, I think uh, technically it it, it you could, and you would use a you would use a soft tissue sarcoma um, um, uh, uh, summary, um, but in the rest I, I have not. Uh, that's a, an uncommon tumor, fortunately, uh, and I see more of those in, in consultation than I do 
um, you know, as a profit investment. But um, but no, I would not actually do a, a, a summary. I think that it's uh, such a, a red event that, I mean, if you do, I think you would use the soft tissue, um, so you'd use the soft tissue uh, format for that. Specific question, how how do you report tumor cells are uh, in uh, uh, no Tyler vessels. Um, in the in the node proper, I would I would actually call it a, a negative node, and um, then just have a, a comment that this is uh, it's similar to if it's in a lymphatic space or uh, in the capsule. Uh, I don't consider that an actual metastasis, so um, I, I would put a comment that describes it, but I would call it an N zero. Okay, then a question is from Dr. C.S. Myung at North York General. Relate inter-observer variability in a low positive ER and PR cases in the 1% to 2% range. Just comment on the uh, inter-observer variability issue. Well, um, I, that's a good point. Um, but, um, I rely on my involvement in the, uh, the College of American Pathology immunohistochemistry proficiency uh, testing for ER and PR um, and uh, sort of late the consensus uh, uh, that has, has not been achieved on various cases that are that the various laboratories um, uh, look at um, I think that um, I think this probably if someone calls something one percent and someone calls something is it percent or or one plus two plus. I'm sorry. Until your percentage. Not to me. Well, I'll I'll try to do both. I'm so I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> I didn't I didn't uh, catch on to that quicker. But um, I think intensity is a less less. Um, I think you see it. Uh, then you ought to call it. And uh, whether it's weak or moderate is one plus or two plus. I think is not not a, a cool difference. Um, that medical oncologists won't be able to offer um, estrogen therapy. And so um, if I'm on the fence, um, then I, I probably will lean towards uh, calling something more than 1%. Uh, 1% is considered a positive uh, value for for estrogen receptors. So uh, we, we have these lively discussions at our tumor board. And, um, you know, it, it really boils down to individual patients, but a lot of times our medical oncologists We'll will use the information and and um, and use an anti-estrogen um, um, recommendation. So can I always say one percent uh, and I tell one percent from two percent? No, I can't. But it's it's basically low level expressor, and I think that's the information that needs to be um, transmitted to the to the treating physician. Is there is Enough estrogen receptor positivity here to consider it a positive result, but it's a low low level expressor. So I think even five percent versus one percent is not that critical as long as they're both called positive. Okay, here's a from uh, Dr. Pam Smith in Windsor. Uh, how do you report lymph node mets after a neoadjuvant chemotherapy? It's a little bit uh, similar question to the uh, the T stage for the for the primary after neoadjuvant therapy. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll just see a, a really intense fibrotic and histiocytic reaction, uh, and not. Uh... Hello. Hello. Here. Okay. I did. Okay. Sorry about. Okay. Good. No. Right. Um. Um. You know the single. Just Focus uh, just just as you would in the uh, non neoadjuvants uh, uh, with the you know I'm a I'm a I'm quick to use comments to try to describe uh, the findings uh, when when things don't up perfectly or it's a little bit of an unusual situation I'm also quick to call the um, treating physician or the surgeon and, and discuss um, the things and I think you know the whole multidisciplinary approach is is the way to go on that but. And just, I think you just need to measure the single largest focus and, and um, report that. Here's an interesting question, more on the uh, the side. Do, do your surgeons <laughs> recognize 
the papillomas identified on core biopsy, or are they followed clinically with, for example, imaging? If so, for how long? Um, I think that's a, sort of an individual institution um, <clears throat> approach. Um, our institution is uh, our approach is that if we diagnose a papilloma on a core biopsy, um, then the uh, are excised. Um, the likelihood if there's, a, if there's proliferative activity within it. Uh, the, there could be some atypical ductal hyperplasia and you haven't sampled it adequately. And so, in general, uh, uh, true ductal papillomas, um, the usual recommendation is excision for those. Uh, and, and one reason, of course, also is that these things sometimes are symptomatic and um, uh, could nipple discharge. And so patients often want to have that removed from, from that point of view. If it's a micropapilloma, really out in the terminal duct, um, and, uh, less than... Uh, uh, three millimeters, then in our institution, those do not get removed. I won't, won't even report those, a uh, little micropapilloma, unless it's very clear that that was the lesion that was uh, uh, being biopsied, and that's that's unusual because they're so small that they don't see them. From Dr. Islam in Ottawa, do you recommend excision where there is atypical apocrine adenosis, brackets AA, on biopsy? And not not so much, you know. Apocrine cells in the usual setting of a cyst don't give us any trouble. And then you put those in an area of adenosis, and uh, people get um, kind of excited. So if the if the nuclei and the cells look pretty much like they would if they were lining a cyst, then just call it um, apocrine change in, in adenosis and and not um, the specter of of atypical. Um, I, in fact, I don't. I don't like to use the word atypical unless I'm linking it to um, a, a term that is proven in long-term follow-up studies. For instance, atypical hyperplasia or atypical lot of hyperplasia. I had a conversation with a surgeon recently, a case in consultation. The uh, original pathologist had called something atypical, but it was more, it looked a little funny, and that I, he called it atypical. And of course, to the surgeon, Atypical on a core biopsy means I have to excise this. So I, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word atypical unless I'm linking it to um, a, a, an entity that has uh, definite clinical implications. Um, if there is um, sclerosing adenosis that has a lot of uh, geomorphic apocrine type cells, then I might. Um, I'll call that something like, um, and if there's actually a pro actually a proliferant in that setting, I might call it um, apocrine atypical to hyperplasia um, if I felt that that needed to be excised. But it, it would require uh, a good bit of a good bit of amorphism um, for me to, to do that. Another question, uh, if you do biomarkers on, on core biopsy and HER2, HER2 is negative, why repeat it? on an excision, 85% are negative anyways, and heterogeneity levels are less than 1%. Um, so, uh, um, I would, uh, if core biopsy um, was negative for, uh, well, there are a couple, couple issues. If the core biopsy was negative for um, estrogen and progesterone receptor, and I had strong internal controls, um, you're right, it's probably going to be negative on the excision. Um, but I see it regardless because um, of the small but real like uh, real possibility that it, it could be um, um, a sling effect or, or heterogeneous. And, and medical oncologists will be repeated um, because they, they are going to want to give uh, a possible opportunity for um those specific treatments, so, uh, and that's probably a difference somewhat in, in uh, uh, the culture practice uh, of medicine. Um, for instance, I, I described that I had five different patterns of uh, invasive carcinoma. Um, I was actually in favor of just doing the largest focus, but uh, my uh, colleagues in medical oncology wanted me to, to work up each of those different patterns. Well, what I can tell you earlier in the presentation is all the patterns, despite the fact that they had different morphology, they all were estrogen receptor positive. So, um, um, you know, I think sometimes clinicians ask for things uh, just 
because they can hear it, get, get the information. Uh, sometimes I think it's not really going to change exactly what they do. Um, I think, you know, on a core biopsy, uh, we, we've seen occasion where uh, there was at least some focal expression in the excision. So I think from that point of view, it's a, a, an unreasonable thing to do. And does that refer, re, refer to her to as well as the Eastern progesterone receptor? Uh, it really is, um, and I realize that that's a you know that's a financial burden uh, to do that. But um, uh, part of it also, and at least in our institution, is a lot of uh, a lot of patients are offered various clinical trials, and so in order to have patients qualify for the clinical trials, and you know, that has to be completely hammered out. So I think that also is part of the the culture of of this institution. But um, that that is the, the practice. Okay, here's a, is it worth mentioning neuroendocrine features in invasive carcinoma? Does it have any significance for prognosis? It does not have any um, significance for prognosis, and so I, I would not, in fact, do that. Uh, I don't want to uh, have a, a physician um, think that, um, um, that it needs to be treated like a, a you know a small cell carcinoma or something like that. So no, I I, w I would not do that. Okay, here's something about staging. How do you do an end stage uh, in a new adjuvant setting for ITCs in the lymph node? Will it be PN1 or PN0? Be PN0 with, with Y. Yep. I mean, the, the tumor cells are N0, so um, uh, it, it would, that would be the same. But you know, would want to have that Y qualifier on to make sure that everybody who needs this was post-treatment. Well, shockingly, that's the end of the question. <laughs> like, well, by 28 questions, so that was pretty good, Gene. So I, I'd just like to make a few closing remarks now, okay? Uh, Alpha Cancer Care Ontario, the uh, Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I really want to thank Gene for a truly comprehensive, informative, and a very, very clear presentation today. This is the third session of our 2013 series on the CAP checklist. And we welcome your comments and suggestions for ways to ensure these sessions are informative and relevant to your practice. Please include your feedback and suggestions as part of the online evaluation. Once the next recording of this presentation becomes available, it will be made available for wide distribution via links through Cancer Care and Trail, the partnership and the Canadian Association of Pathologists. Access to this recording will be available for you at your convenience and is not restricted. Uh, as a reminder, both the live and reported presentations are eligible for CME credits. In order to get the CME credits for attending or viewing the educational session, you must complete an evaluation form for each session accessed or viewed in its entirety. The link to the web-based survey has been included in the session notices that was listed earlier. Please note CME certificates for each CAP checklist session will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but the certificates will only be issued for one month. Please, re once again, refer to session notices for the exact deadline date. So once again, I want to thank you. Just remind everybody that our next uh, presentation is on Wednesday, March the 6th, and we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Kathy Stryker uh, from St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. She's going to be talking about the checklist for stomach cancer and also giving us an update on the gastric HER2 program. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks, Mr. Wrigley, for